All right, welcome everybody. Um, today we're very excited to welcome Emily Natchison to Clark College. She is a multimedia artist. She received a BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in 2006 and an MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2010. Natchison has had numerous solo exhibitions and she's been included in multiple group shows across the country. This year, she received an artistic focus project grant from the Regional Arts and Culture Council in Portland, Oregon. Natcherson is currently the interim fiber department chair and a visiting faculty member at the Oregon College of Art and Craft in Portland, Oregon. So let's welcome Emily tonight. Thank you, Jamie. Can, can you guys hear me if I talk at this level? It's OK? All right. Um, well, I'm very excited to be participating in your lecture series and to visit the school. This is my first time up at Clark College, and it's a really beautiful and very official feeling campus. I feel like I'm in a college. It's, it's very nice. Um, tonight, I'm going to give you a chronological overview of my work. One of the things I will focus on in this talk is how each piece led to the next. These first few slides represent some of my undergraduate work. In my artwork, I explore the human perception of nature and transformation. Mythology, scientific history, and New Age idealism become starting points for an investigation into the cultural creation of landscape. I have always been interested in the concept of transformation and how we as human beings translate transformation in nature, how we explain it, mythologize it, process it, and turn it into phenomena. As a child, I loved folklore, fairy tales, and mythology. And one of the elements that stuck out for me about those stories was how often the landscape itself became a site for transformation. Most of the folk tales and fairy tales I was reading were Western European, so consequently, the landscape was typically the forest. Once a character entered the mythological forest landscape, they had crossed a threshold into a mythological transformative realm. So I think I'll just take a moment to mention um, the images that I've shown so far were screen prints on fabric using dye and um, then hand painting with dye as well. So the, the interesting thing about them is that the dye is the color is actually embedded in the surface itself instead of just sitting on top of it like a, a typical painting. Um, in these stories, the forest became a place of shifting barriers and identities, depicting a space where the structures of the civilized world were reordered. Here, the surrounding environment shifted between acting as a landscape and as a character itself. Children were transformed into birds and deer, princesses were transformed into swans, animals could talk, time could stand still. I think it's important here to note that I grew up in Southern California, and we did not have coniferous forests. In fact, I didn't see a forest until much later. So to me, the forest remained a mostly mythological site. When I began graduate school, I focused on the theme of the forest as a transformative space and created sculptures and installations centered around this idea. This piece titled Ram House is made from foam, plywood, horn, and wool blankets. When I came up with the idea for this piece, I was thinking about cuckoo clocks, which are traditionally carved out of wood. I wanted the form of the sculpture to be like a cuckoo clock, comprised of several elements that could relay a narrative and all made out of the same material, creating one unit. I left the horns uncovered because they were the only natural component of the piece, and I wanted to highlight this as a valuable element. Although this piece was meant to contain several elements, I decided to leave it as a dual relationship between the animal and the house. So to me, it almost looks like an hourglass form, where they're both equal. The work became much more visceral over time. This piece titled Bunny Rider was the first I did in a series of, of black rabbit, stick, and mound forms. These pieces were built through a layering process of accumulated natural and synthetic materials that were then saturated with heavy black enamel paint. The majority of this work was made by mimicking organic growth and geological sediment, similar to how you might drip, build a drip castle. For example, I would slowly layer materials by dripping paint, throwing paper mache, and dumping buckets of glue and sand over forms. I did this so that the pieces would feel natural, as if they had been created over time by natural forces, like a tree burl or geode. I wanted to keep my hand as the maker invisible. 
If I lower the mic microphone, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, this series of work was meant to feel as if it rose up from the dark matter of the forest floor. I chose to make the work black so that it was reduced to a dark textural silhouette. In my work, I often use monochromatic color palettes and surface treatments to classify, illustrate, and group objects. This system suggests a shared narrative about environment, origin, and history. By skinning or coating objects in one material and color, I visually unify the form, which is often made from a variety of found objects and materials. After focusing on animal forms that existed on the ground, I began thinking about what would exist above in the environment I was creating. Many of the sculptural forms I had been making were mound and pile shape, so I find this new form, to find this new form, I mirrored the image of a mound. Um, this, to me, looked a lot like the drape of a net. Uh, this installation is called Artifacts. So after that, I began to intuitively make colorful nets out of wax linen thread and tie objects into them, such as quartz crystals, blackbird feathers, and pieces of metallic shred to attract light. These nets represented a middle ground, hung from above but containing elements from an earthly realm. At this time, I was reading a lot of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, and was thinking about mythology and Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconscious. I also began to experiment with the shadows cast by the nets and began bringing in more synthetic materials. The denser hanging form in this image is military camouflage netting that has been dipped in latex paint. After making the nets for several months, I began to ab abstract the forms and think less about the original animal narrative of the pieces and more about the environment I was creating and what the physical experience was of standing inside one of my installations. This idea led to a series of installations consisting of industrial netting and white military camouflage netting hung from the ceiling, creating an environment of knotted webs and hanging masses. This work asked viewers to slightly bend and negotiate their bodies as they moved in and around the installation, making it subtly narrative, or sorry, subtly interactive. Um, I transformed the netting to resemble vines and parasitic plants by cutting up the grid of the net, tying together sections of the materials, and then heavily coating them with white paint. By altering the grid of the pattern, the grid of the pattern of the netting to resemble plant forms, the installation spoke of structural decomposition. There are four incarnations of this piece, white mass, white netting, white room, and white environment. I continually built up the installation through the addition of new materials, painting, cutting, and rearranging sections. Because of the intuitive nature of this work and its lack of built-in structure, every time I installed it for display or to work on it in my studio, um, I hung it differently. So the piece was constantly evolving. While I was making white, the white netting series, I began to associate the installations with underwater environments, like kelp forests or suspended masses of trash found in the ocean. Additionally, the shadows of the nets resemble plant forms and the surface of water from underneath looking up. Since I had spent a lot of time in the ocean growing up, I realized that I had a much deeper understanding of what it felt like to be underwater than I did of being in a forest landscape. I use this understanding to envision an otherworldly natural space. To me, the ocean represents the transformative and looming wilderness that I had sought to represent through the forest in my earlier work. This realization has greatly helped my understanding of installational space. Formally, I chose to make these installations white. I continually use white within my work as a way to signal the possibility of transformation and allow the surface treatment of the piece to become the focal point. I use the connotations that white carries with it, purity, cleanliness, and spirituality. However, the work is not clean. It is multi-layered. I use white paint as a way of coating, glazing, and layering, creating a crust over the forms and found materials in my installations. By coating my materials in the associations of white, I suggested that the forms are not pure, but coated, hiding a darker history. I also began incorporating chandelier crystals into several of the forms to signal organic growth and accumulation. I wanted the crystals to, to appear as if they had grown like flowers or fruit out of the sculpture. 
Crystals were a fitting object to grow from the repurposed grids of the nets because of their geometric shape. The internal structure of a crystal is actually composed out of a set of atoms arranged like a, like a grid um, in a pattern called a lattice. The symmetry and structure of this pattern determines what the facets of the form of the crystal will look like. By referencing chandeliers and jewelry, the crystals turned the installation into a romanticized and decorative vision of nature. In these installations, I also began to experiment with light and shadow. The crystals were meant to attract light and reflect small rainbows onto the forms, referencing decoration, romanticism, and New Age spirituality. White Room was the largest and most immersive iteration of this series, and, and this coincidentally is an image of White Room. Um, after making White Room, I began to reconsider what it meant to be mimicking nature and constructing spaces that were meant to convey a sense of beauty. This seemed problematic in a world of constructed artificial environments and experiences. So I began researching the history of kitsch, romanticism, and the construction of artificial nature. And while I was doing that research, I made a set of fake rocks, titled Rocks. <laughs> there you laughed now. Good. Someone laughed. Um, the rocks were made by carving styrofoam and coating them with a textured sealant, the same way that fake rocks are made for movie sets. During that time period, I also made a piece titled Swan Song. This piece consisted of two large swans and a fake crystal carved out of pink insulation foam. The foam sculptures in this piece are flat, reminiscent of a stage set. These forms, unlike the hanging work in White Room, did not attempt to hide anything about the way they were made or presented. The artist's hand is visible. I stood the shapes upright as you would a paper doll by cutting out notches in the base and inserting foam tabs. The curve of the swan's necks are meant to create a vaguely heart-shaped arch, sim similar to the Tunnel of Love amusement park ride popular in the early 20th century. After researching the history and construction of artificial nature, I began thinking about how this could be applied to a self-contained installation, which led me to the history of vernacular architecture, particularly the history of the grotto. So now I will digress for a moment and talk briefly about the history of grottos. The trend of building grottos, follies, and fake ruins began in the late 13th century and has continued up until present day. Grottos are historically a personal space, reflecting a desire to create an inner world. There's a long history of these spaces being the obsessive, hand-built project of one individual. I am particularly interested in the grottos and fake ruins built in the Victorian era. I often use the Victorian era as a historical reference point in my work because of their nostalgic fascination with the natural world. Because this time period coincides with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the Victorians created a highly stylized culture of melancholy centered around a romantic vision of nature and loss. My favorite example of this is King Ludwig II of Bavaria's Venus Grotto. Built in 1877 as part of a subterranean lake in the castle of Linderhof, King Ludwig's Grotto was designed as a personal hermitage and theater for Wagnerian operas where the king would listen to private performances and float around in a shell-shaped boat surrounded by swans. And this is an illustration of that grotto in King Ludwig. The Venus Grotto was designed to look like an ancient cave, but was entirely artificial, built out of synthetic materials such as cement, steel, plaster, and paper mache. This trend of building artificial landscaping or imitation nature began at the end of the 13th century and culminated in fantasy gardens, fake ruins, and grottos like that of King Ludwig's. In these, structurals, natural de in these structures, natural decomposition became a sculptural and decorative element. The artificialization of nature that began with fake grottos was a reaction to the industrialization and a new emphasis on rational thought in the church and popular culture. Nature, now devoid of meaning, became symbolic and was embraced by Romanticism in the 1800s as a representation of human emotion. Throughout history, humans have displayed a desire to reinterpret and physically recreate the natural world. I feel that my work is a continuation of this idea. This piece is titled White Grotto. White Grotto presented a fabricated vision of nature and personal space. The structure's exterior is plywood, painted matte white. 
I designed the outer shell to be different than the interior, like a geode, oyster, or jewelry box, so that the viewer does not completely expect what is inside the form before entering. The shape, ex the shape of the structure itself is model modeled after a diamond. The exterior is white, like the interior, to signal that it is one unified form. The lit up exposed section of the interior references a diorama um, and diorama composition and display. In contrast to the exterior, the interior of White Grotto was made by mimicking organic growth through building up a surface of heavily painted uh, spray foam and polystyrene. The entrance to the structure is a four foot high cut out of a heart. Because of the height of the doorway, the viewer has to bend down in order to step inside. This subtle bodily shift heightens the sense of crossing the threshold into a new space. The heart-shaped doorway is a signal that by stepping through into the grotto, the viewer will be entering a romanticized world. It is also a nod to the Tunnel of Love amusement park ride and King Ludwig II's Venus Grotto. This shape also gives the structure a more cart cartoonish and childlike quality and functions as a frame for a small composed view of the interior. The forms within this piece, like the construction of the walls, are not completely believable. Paint soaked matted feathers stick out of the swan's bodies and the crystal forms rising up from the ground and out of the walls are crude and cartoonish. On closer inspection, the corrugated surface of the cardboard is visible. The swans seated in the interior reiterate the concept of a romanticized and constructed nature. They function as lamps, shifting from characters within a narrative to, decor to decorative functional objects. While the mirrors embedded in the walls create an illusion of deeper space, they can only reflect the viewer's image. This element repeats the idea that the space itself is a constructed fantasy. It is a reflection of a human created vision, nat a vision of nature. After building White Grotto, I began to think less about creating full environments and began focusing on the individual sculptural elements within my work. This piece is titled Hylozoic. It was installed in Portland, Oregon at False Front Gallery. The title Hylozoic comes from the term Hylozoism, which is a philosophical doctrine that says that all matter has life and therefore all matter is universally connected. Hylozoic is a sculptural mound of black saturated forms. It is meant to feel like a small island of matter that is constantly shifting. The pentagon shaped walkway around the constructed, um, around the sculpture was constructed from panels filled with iron oxide cob clay. During the show, viewers were invited to stand on the platform and walk around the sculpture to view it. And here's a detail. This piece was built similar to um, how I made the bunny rabbit, the, the bunny rider piece, um, with black enamel and by layering and layering and layering materials. This piece was titled Tectonic. It was installed in the Portland Building installation space. This piece, like Hylozoic, is a small animated geological form. As I made Hylozoic and Tectonic, the geological forms I had been making began to take on their own personas for me. During a residency at WorkSound Gallery in Portland, I decided to play with this idea and created two, two pieces titled Super Mounts. I also made this large blue structure in the background. Um, the, superman, the super mounds were much more animated and playful than my previous work. I think of them as hybrids of geological sediment and popsicles. The painting in the background was by my studio mate Nathaniel Thayer Moss. Um, the work is not meant to go together, however I like how visually jarring the combo of our work is. And actually on a side note, this is how I met um, Jamie at this work sound residency. This next piece is titled Deliquest One. It is the first in a series of work based on life and death cycles in mushrooms. Um, so one of my favorite aspects of living in the Pacific Northwest is how interested people are in ecology. It seems to come up in everyday conversation. One day I was talking with a friend and she was telling me about the life and death cycle of ink cap mushrooms. 
Apparently ink cap mushrooms, like other caprinoid mushrooms, have gills that liquefy as its spores mature. This causes the mushroom to turn black and decay so that they literally melt into a puddle of their own ink. The person I was talking with was attempting to make drawings using ink from these mushrooms. After the fact, I could just not get the image of a melting black mushroom out of my mind. So I made this piece titled Deliquesce. Deliquesce literally means to disappear as if by melting or to become liquid during decomposition. I think it's a really beautiful word. In Deliquesce, I combine the image of mushrooms in different stages of decomp decomposition with the symbol of a fairy ring. When mushrooms grow in a circle, it is often called a fairy ring. There are at least 60 different mushroom species that grow in these patterns, although to the best of my knowledge, ink caps are not one of them. In folklore, fairy rings are interpreted as, resu as a result of fairies dancing or as gateways to elfin kingdoms. They have also been thought to represent the activity of witches and the devil. The following year, I was given an opportunity by Bullseye Gallery to participate in a duo show with artist Michael Endo and explore kiln-formed glass as a medium. Uh, the painting in this image is by Michael Endo, and this is an um, installation view of our show of other spaces. For this show, I decided to revisit the theme of life and death cycles represented by mushroom decay and created Portal. Portal is made entirely of cast white glass. Glass is a fitting medium for work about transformation since the material itself is in a state of uh, constant flux. For Portal, I also use the format of a circle to reference the endless cycle, as well as the folkloric fairy rings. After making large installations in the past that were aimed at transporting the viewer to an alternate and otherworldly reality, I found it very interesting to create a piece about the potential for escape, the potential for an altered experience. Instead of showing the viewer what I thought they would want to see, I like the idea of suggesting that fantasy is only psychological. This piece marks a new direction in my work. Previously, my artwork centered around mimicking nature and the cultural creation of landscape. Portal marks a new interest for me in material transformation. The process of casting glass has made me consider weight, volume, and materiality in a new way, which I believe is largely responsible for the shift in artistic focus and approach. This piece is titled Fairy Tale Trees. Um, it was constructed out of steel, branches, resin, and enamel. The fruit hanging from the branches is cast out of white, opaque glass. The trees also have glass fungus growing out of them. This piece, similar to Swan Song, is a curved archway creating a potential gateway. Also, similar to my previous hanging work, the shadows play an important role in this sculpture. And then here are some details of the branches with the glass fruit. And then this is a detail of the glass fungus. Um, last year I began making a series of work exploring the life and, death life and death cycles and the transformation of matter. Hall of Conversion, pictured here, was the first piece in this series. It was installed in the Disjecta Contemporary Art Center's Vestibule Gallery. I think of Hall of Conversion as being the next iteration of the portal sculpture. It is more complex, but definitely grew out of the same idea. Hall of Conversion consisted of 74 hanging glass dishes and cast glass sculptures. Each dish balanced a glass sculptural piece that shared the exact same weight and volume as the rest. The glass pieces shape-shifted from one form to the next, illustrating natural cycles of growth and decay while retaining the same volumetric proportion. This piece served as a reflection of our ever-changing yet never-dying world. Our wo world is one of transformation and not destruction. Each piece, piece in Hall of Conversion is different. The sculptural objects grow, decay, and shift. Each shift is marked by a slight color change as well. The colors shift from a blue-gray to white to yellow to gold to red to pink and then back again. I chose to use rich gem-like colors to underscore the feeling of preciousness and to make the hallway of the vestibule gallery reference a hall of gems in a museum or reliquary. One aspect that I find very interesting about glass is that it is considered such a precious and fragile material. 
This is a shift from the everyday repurposed building materials I had been working with previously and the connotations that they carry. I am interested in using the fragility of glass to create a relationship with the viewer, to make the viewer aware of their actions in a space and of their physical proximity to the work. The architecture of Vestibule Gallery provided an interesting challenge for displaying and hanging work. The gallery is a long, narrow hallway. I hung the pieces in a column that cut through the center of the space. The work was hung just below eye level so that viewers could look down at the pieces as if they were scientific specimens resting on an invisible table. Because the space was so tight, viewers had to be very careful as they walked down the hall. This contributed to a sense of preciousness about the work. The second piece I did in this series was titled Crystalline Conversion. Similar to Hall of Conversion, Crystalline Conversion is a series of shape-shifting organic objects cast in glass. These pieces also retain the same weight as they change form. To me, this is very important because it implies that the actual form does not matter. It is literally the same material changing shape in front of the viewer. Here are some details from the installation that illustrate the growth and decay cycles. So here's a mushroom growing. So it's almost full grown. A full grown mushroom that's starting to have another piece growing out of it. And then that piece starts to take on more of a life of its own and gets bigger. And then here's an image of a mushroom decaying. Rock, rock begins to crystallize. Crystal growing. I will conclude this lecture by talking about my current research and a few of my upcoming projects. This past summer, I visited the Yale University Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. I went there to view and document their alchemical book and manuscript collection. This is an image of the Beinecke Library. The trip was made possible by a Regional Arts and Culture Council Artistic Focus Project Grant. The Beinecke Alchemical Collection was donated by Mary Mellon. Mellon was a dedicated follower of Carl Jung and was largely responsible for his American presence. Carl Jung based much of his research on universal symbols of alchemy and, al and alchemical texts. So Mary Mellon collected as many of the alchem alchemical books and manuscripts that she could find that had been mentioned by Jung in his writings and lectures. This is one of the elements that drew me to the collection, since I have always been interested in Jung's work. Um, here are a few images from the manuscripts I viewed. I took hundreds of photographs, which I am now in the process of editing through. The manuscripts I viewed were dated from 1209 AD to 1790. This is an image from one of the more recent books in the collection. It's from 1790. Most of the documents I viewed had illustrations of alchemical processes and transformations that were personified and veiled in Christian symbology and allegory. Because the alchemist's goal was both spiritual and material, alchemy offers a unique combination of the practical and highly symbolic. Materials were endowed with highly figurative personas and narratives. In reading nature symbolically, the alchemists were depicting the human thought process at work. Many of the books themselves are going through a transformation. The books have been rebound repeatedly, and the ink on that many of the texts were written with um, was not archival and has burned through and eaten away many of the pages. The ink that was used was usually made from oak gall, which is commonly used, was a commonly used ink in the Middle Ages. This is an image of one of the decaying texts. Many of the book pages in the collection were so eaten away that they looked like lace. This image is from a manuscript from 1550 with small ink drawings of alchemical apparatus, mostly flasks and other glasswork. Um, this image is from one of my favorite pieces in the collection. It is the Voynich Manuscript. Um, the Voynich manuscript is thought to date back to 1209 AD and is the oldest known botanical and alchemical manuscript. It was written on parchment in an unidentifiable language thought to be derivative of Roman. The Voynich manuscript is full of beautiful and crude drawings of plant species. It has also a bit of a cult following. Some people believe that it contains secrets and some people think it is a fake. Um, it is a very interesting book, and it, it's very gorgeous to look through. I feel very lucky that I was able to view and handle it. 
Um, here are a few other images from the collection. They are from a manuscript from 1760. Most of the images and the writing is about the order of the um, Rosicrucius. The Rosicrucian order is a philosophical and humanistic fraternal organization doted to, devoted to, quote, the study of the elusive mysteries of life and the universe. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces. The square piece on the bottom is a piece of vellum with a phoenix drawn onto it. And on the back of the vellum, obscured with a the drawing of the phoenix, is backwards writing that's actually been pasted into the book. So they were very secretive about um, this knowledge. I'm still processing these images. My trip to the Beinecke Library was a great experience. It has broadened my interest and in understanding in alchemy. I'm fascinated by how secretive this information was and how it is a record of a moment in history where science and mysticism coexisted. Um, and to wrap it up, this July I have a solo exhibition opening um, at Bullseye Gallery titled The Realm of Quantifiable Truths. Um, the exhibition opens July 3rd. This past summer I visited Scotland to begin preliminary research for a project that I'm currently working on with Bullseye. The work displayed at Bullseye this summer will later travel to Scotland and be installed in a uh, converted 17th century barn in the Scottish Highlands. I will be going again this summer to install a section of the show and teach a two-week workshop um, at Northlands Glass with Michael Endo. The workshop is a collaboration between the Oregon College of Art and Craft and Bullseye Glass. Um, here's a picture of the barn before the renovations that I will be installing in. Here's the outside. Here are some sheep. <laughs> Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, if you are in Portland this summer, please come by the show. Um, it looks like we still have plenty of time for questions if anybody um, has any. If not, thank you. That's a very good point. Um, I feel like the viewer doesn't really experience that. I feel like it's kind of, you don't really see um, the endurance activity that it truly is. Cause, and, and I think that's really interesting for me. Um, the actual, I come from a, a fibers background. I didn't really talk about this, but I come from a fibers background. And so the act of knotting and tying is, is very interesting and meditative to me. And the idea of um, obscuring a grid pattern is very interesting. So. Um, yes, it, it was very performative, but it wasn't really something that I incorporated into um, the final images of the work. And it's funny because the final images of the work are so peaceful and slightly looming, but the actual process of it was like drenched in paint on a ladder, tying, sweating, and, and it might be worth revisiting from that angle at some point. That's a good point. <laughs> Sparkling glass. Um, well, the the original nuts that I made, like the pink and yellow ones, I would say there was a, a quartz crystal every inch across the whole way, um, and so the the net itself became very heavy and kind of like the skin. Um, so when it hung, it had a lot of drape, and you don't really see that in the images. Um, the other pieces, the hanging white pieces, you kind of have to come up to it, and then you'd see them. So similar to a drawing, it would be a moment of detail. Um, and I, I started to get it to the point where you could start to see little rainbows reflecting, but I didn't really go 
as far as I could have, I suppose. Well, no, I, you know, I'm just, it just made me think a lot about like semi precious versus kind of, I don't know, like less precious or something, you know, the throwaway kind of material. And, you know, I was wondering how much, if, if any of that still plays out in your kind of more now precious glassware that you've been doing recently, where they, everything feels kind of gem like and tends to glow from however it's led and, and it, it feels kind of like it's shed a little bit of that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an, inter it's an interesting observation. And in the, the work that I'm creating now in my studio for this upcoming show is bringing in a little more of that, um, but it's definitely not as extreme as it was before. Great. All right, thank you so much.